Thank you for your patience. Now we will move on to the closing session. Throughout the entirety of our annual meeting program, we've had two plenary sessions and five technology sessions. Summaries of those discussions and insight for presentations will be available on our official website in due course. So please check them for updates. In addition, all sessions will be available on demand. Please take advantage of these features to view the sessions that interest you. And now I would like to invite Mr. David Sandalo, ISAF Steering Committee, to present his remarks on the ISAF Roadmap, Artificial Intelligence and Climate Mitigation, if you please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to our, our moderator for all your uh, keeping us on track and, and your wonderful moderating of these, of these sessions. Um, I just want to start by thanking everybody who's organized this tremendous conference. There's just such an incredible staff of people who pulled this together, and they're behind the scenes. They don't get the attention they deserve. So could we just give them a big round of applause? Thank you so much. And thank you to our chair, uh, Chair Tanaka, who is, who is here somewhere. Uh, let me quickly tell you about the roadmap that we're releasing today in draft form. Um, this, uh, we, we have a great team of authors. You see, this is, we pulled together a team of people both with energy expertise and artificial intelligence expertise to talk about how do we use artificial intelligence for climate change mitigation. Um, and here's the question that we answer in this roadmap, or we're trying to answer in this roadmap, which is how can artificial intelligence help reduce emissions of greenhouse gases? Um, uh, two questions that we actually didn't explore, but they're really, they're bigger questions and maybe for other roadmaps. How can AI help adapt to climate change? I think artificial intelligence has a very important role in climate change adaptation. And then there's a really big question about on balance is AI going to be good or bad for climate change mitiga uh, mitigation? We didn't try to get into that. What we're really doing is just asking, knowing that AI tools are moving fast and developing quickly, how can we use them positively to help reduce emissions of greenhouse gases? Um, this has been a pattern for all of our um, ICEP roadmaps. We release them at this conference. We open them for public comment for a couple of weeks. Um, and here's the address. Please take a look. It's up on the ISEP website. Send it to people you know who have expertise in this topic. And send comments to ISEP 2023 roadmap at gmail.com by the end of the month. And if you do that, then our team is going to work intensively in November to finalize this for release in the Japan Pavilion um, at, during COP28 um, in Dubai. Here's our table of contents. Um, the roadmap has three parts. Uh, first, some introductory material um, on AI and climate change. We, we always try to write these roadmaps both for a generalist audience and for a specialist audience and try to, try to kind of do both. Um, and so we have some introductory material for people who may not be familiar with either of these topics. Then we look at six high potential opportunities, six places where we think that AI could help with reduction of greenhouse gases and then some cross-cutting topics. Um, so I'm just going to have a few minutes here. I'm just going to hit on some highlights. Um, we have a chapter on introducing AI, written by a professor of artificial intelligence at the Columbia Engineering School, um, who's here in, in Tokyo, um, Dr. Alp, Alp uh, Kuchu Kelber. Um, and he, we make these points. I don't have time to get into them now. Um, also an introduction to climate change for maybe for some AI experts who may not be familiar with the climate change issue. Uh, I'm just going to, I want to highlight these middle bullets, which people here may be familiar with, but if you're not, I think it's worth highlighting that July 6, 2023 was the warmest day ever recorded. We've had reliable temperature records for, what, more than 100 years? We, can have, we have the IPCC chair in the room. He can confirm this for us. but, but um, uh, but more, more than 100 years. Um, July 2023 was the warmest month ever recorded, um, the warmest nine years on record or the past nine years. And I read in a news article this morning or yesterday that preliminary temperature records suggest that, that September 2023 was by far the warmest September ever recorded globally, that September temperatures were more like July temperatures around the world. Um, so I'll just cut 
uh, touch on a couple of the high potential opportunities that we discussed in the roadmap. One of them is in greenhouse gas emissions monitoring. We now, we're at a point where we can start to do something we've never been able to do before, which is real-time monitoring of greenhouse gas emissions at the source level. And that's because of all the satellites that are circulating that, uh, with new spectroscopy and other types of analytic um, and, uh, optical tools, um, with drones, with uh, airplanes, with land-based sensors, but they're throwing off massive amounts of data. And machine learning tools are central to processing all that data, but with machine learning tools, We've already been able to uh, measure methane emissions at a level of, uh, uh, of accuracy that we lacked previously, and that's shaping the regulation of methane around the world. Um, we can, with artificial intelligence tools, also understand deforestation and what's happening in real time um, in deforestation um, in ways that give enforcement authorities better tools. So there's real exciting opportunities, I think, using machine learning tools um, for greenhouse gas emissions monitoring. Also for the power grid and the power sector, um, one clear application is better understanding wind and solar and wind and sun patterns, and that's helping us integrate uh, wind, solar and, and wind power into electric grids. But more broadly, I talked to one uh, uh, expert who said it's impossible to imagine really having a distributed um, electric grid of the future without AI tools to help us manage that. A, a third very exciting is, area is in materials innovation. I, I mentioned this in the last session, but I'll just repeat it. When Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, um, it literally took him months of physically testing different metals to figure out ultimately that tungsten was the best way to, to have a light bulb. Um, we now have the ability to simulate this with machine learning tools and, and do millions of these tests in a second and, and get a sense of what the best properties are. And that promises rapid acceleration of innovation in the energy area. I think one of the most exciting areas, by the way, there is infusion in, in, in nuclear power where we can um, rapidly accelerate, I hope, the innovation in that area using machine learning tools. Um, so, uh, we identified five barriers um, that uh, stand out kind of cutting across areas. I think the two most important are lack of data and people. And artificial intelligence, one way to think about it is it's really a helpful tool when you have massive amounts of digitized data in an area. But if you don't have large amounts of digitized data, AI is not that helpful. And so systematically thinking about how to expand digitized, and I should say also standardized data, is really critical for this. And another big barrier is a lack of trained personnel, both people who can um, program, uh, but then also just people who can think about how to use these tools, the end users, um, uh, very important issue. And then computation power costs and institutional issues are important as well. AI absolutely has risks. Uh, bias is an enormous risk. There's a famous example of, uh, in this field of Amazon had a hiring um, a, a tool using artificial intelligence. Um, they asked the machine learning tool to identify what made successful people based upon past experiences. And lo and behold, they discovered that people who had played in male sporting teams uh, had performed better over the course of the past 20 years. And so their AI tool ended up being biased in favor of hiring men. Um, and those types of risks exist in the climate change area as well. We could imagine data where uh, wealthy neighborhoods got more investment um, and an AI tool would tend towards biasing you know, against investment in poor areas. Um, there's also risks in terms of invasion of privacy, security, safety. And one very important one which is getting attention is the risk of increasing greenhouse gas emissions from computing operations from AI. And I've dived pretty deeply into the literature on this in the past couple of months. My conclusions are first, that currently greenhouse gas emissions from AI are pretty relatively small, definitely less, significantly less than 1% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And in the future, lots of different scenarios are possible. There's scenarios in which, because of increased efficiencies um, and the use of renewable power, that the greenhouse gas emissions from AI actually go down in the years ahead. But there are also scenarios where they go up significantly. Um, but we need much better data, much better assessment methodologies in this area in general. Um, we have a chapter on policy here, which I don't really have time to get into here. And then I'll just touch on a few findings and recommendations that we make to close. 
Um, the first finding is that AI is currently contributing to climate change mitigation and has the potential to make significant additional contributions in the years ahead. Second, AI is not a panacea when it comes to climate change. And you hear this a little bit. I mean, so, sometimes people say, oh, it's going to help, you know, it's going to solve the climate change problem. Um, you know, AI doesn't move molecules. AI doesn't build transmission lines. AI doesn't, you know, um, build clean factories. AI can help with a lot of things, but it's not a panacea. Um, and then the lack, as I mentioned a moment ago, the lack of trained personnel and, and high quality data are big barriers. And then we have a number of recommendations. Um, some, of the, some of them are that AI tools should be integrated into many aspects of climate change mitigation. It's a powerful tool. If you're doing anything in this field, we recommend that you consider how AI might help. Skills development is a really important priority. Um, uh, and uh, I think every government agency, every business should, should have training programs in this area if you're um, working in climate mitigation. Governments should assist in the development and standardization of data. We don't have it. Um, there's a lot of areas where data development is needed and governments can fund this both uh, in their own operations and with grants to universities and other and businesses and others. Um, and then they can also play a role in standardization of data. Standardization, sta standard setting agencies need to do that as well. And then every government agency should have an AI office in my view. Um, uh, and uh, probably a senior advisor in this area as well. Um, uh, and I'm going to skip over those because I'm running uh, over time. But, but once again, please, uh, this is a draft that we released today. It's um, uh, definitely we welcome uh, comments from, from anyone. Um, send comments to ICEF2023 uh, roadmap at gmail.com. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Sandalo. Next, Professor Dr. Yamaji Kenji, ISAF Steering Committee, will present his remarks on the ISAF roadmap of artificial intelligence and climate mitigation. So, Professor Dr. Yamaji, if you please. Oh, it's my pleasure to be given the role to announce ISEF 2023 statement. Uh, this time, the statement consists of two parts. First part is ISEF's 10th anniversary. And second part is ISEF 2023. Steering committee have had heated discussions on the statement, much hotter than ever. And uh, finally, we have successfully completed the statement at the last moment. OK, this is part one, ISEF's 10th anniversary. ISEF celebrates its 10th anniversary the steering committee is issuing the following special statement. In 2014, ISEF was initiated by Japan's late former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. One of the early achievements of ISEF was helping shape the Paris Agreement by highlighting the importance of innovation. In 2016, ISEF championed the ambitious goal of achieving at least net zero anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions. And since its inception, ISEF's consistent message has been that innovation, both technological and social, is essential to addressing climate change. And since 2017, ISEF's strong creed has been that diversity, inclusiveness, and justice must be enhanced to address the social and governance aspects. 
ISAF has consistently adopted a technology neutral approach to decarbonization, including renewables, nuclear, carbon capture and storage, and end use technologies. ISAF's contributions also include the development of innovation roadmaps. ISAF has been a unique forum for a wide range of stakeholders to interact and advocate for innovation. Over the past nine years, the global situation surrounding climate change has significantly changed. We have witnessed massive deployment of new technologies. However, a huge gap remains between countries' nationally determined contributions, NDCs, and the 1.5 degree C pathway. This year, the G7 leaders in Hiroshima agreed to globally advance and promote a green transformation. G7 leaders are committed to holistically addressing energy security, the climate crisis, and geopolitical risks. They also said, while acknowledging various pathways according to each country's energy situation, industrial and social structures, and geographical conditions, we highlight that these should lead to our common goal of net zero by 2050. To increase energy security and reduce the risk of adverse environmental impacts, it is imperative to expand and diversify supply chains for clean energy technologies and find substitutes for critical minerals. Strengthening North-South international cooperation on topics including transfer of technologies and climate finance is essential toward the future. ISAF's fundamental role and mission remain unchanged. We remain firmly committed to promoting both technological and social innovation while strengthening diversity and inclusiveness. More urgently than ever, we need to accelerate scaling of solutions ISAF embraces new focal challenges. ISAF underscores the importance of not only country perspectives, but also sectoral thinking. In addition, substantial finance, finance deserves stronger focus. ISAF is dedicated to developing new diverse and secure supply chains. ISAF pays particular attention to North-South collaboration to help the Global South thrive in the energy transition and manage inevitable climate impacts. ISAF continues to empower the next generation of innovators. Second part, ISAF 2023. Under the main theme of innovation for just, secure, and sustainable global green transformation, GX, the ISAF's 10th annual meeting, ISAF 2023, was convened in a hybrid format on October 4th and 5th, 2023. Around 1,700 people participated in this event, representing 79 countries and regions. At the conclusion of ISF 2023, the steering committee summarizes a series of discussions as follows. ISF 2023 had in-depth discussions on innovative policy making for building secure and resilient supply chains of energy and resources. 
ISF 2023 also discussed GX together while GX is pursued inclusively with no one left behind. Leading experts dealt with the following five specific issues. First, the global stock take. And second, the linkages between raw food, water, energy, and climate change. Third, the innovative and inclusive use of renewables. And fourth, sustainable aviation. The fifth, nuclear fusion technologies. The ISF steering committee expresses our deepest appreciation for the active participation of speakers and audience. We remain firmly committed to engaging diverse stakeholders, in particular the leading youth, women, you know, and innovators, creating stronger momentum for technological and social innovation for the carbon neutral and sustainable future. And this year also, we prepared infographics, this time celebrating 10th anniversary of ISEF. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. And Professor Dr. Yamaji was introducing ISEF's statement. Sorry for the mistakes. Thank you very much. Next, we would like to ask Mr. Tanaka Nobuo, Chair of the ISAF Steering Committee, to summarize the ISAF 2023. Hello. Summarizing ISAF 2023 is almost an impossible job for me. But I can tell you that uh, ISAF gets a very good participation of more than 1,700 people from 79 countries. This is a great deal, success. And also, uh, the women's share in the panelists is 47%. It's a bit behind the target, but uh, you know, good level. Um, I also ask the Secretariat to give me the number of the participants to the different sessions, including plenary and concurrent sessions. The first, the biggest uh, 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 number is in the opening session and plenary one. Well, that's the beginning, so certainly it may be the case. But the second winner is uh, uh, number three. Innovation, innovative uh, use of the renewables. Congratulations for Yamaji Sensei, Naki, and uh, Kuroda-san. Um, and the third is very interestingly keynote by the Fati Birol this morning, which I didn't see it, but I, I, I was uh, moderating with him. Maybe the Fati still has a kind of legendary person in terms of sustainability and uh, uh, energy security. Well, ISEF uh, started with full of the technological agenda, innovation in the technology, in the renewable solar, wind, and hydrogen, CCS, uh, TCF, the financial sector, R&D, etc. But many of them are moved out of us to a separate session, like TCFD, hydrogen ministerial, CCS discussion, ammonia. Um, and R&D 20, so in, in the, the, this Green Transformation Week, we have six, seven big conferences all together. So always the challenge for us is how can we find a new agenda for the discussion? So as through the discussion in the uh, summarizing plenary, I am very much convinced that probably innovative finance for the just transition is a very important probably next subject. Ismail is contributing a lot to the content, but uh, I think for the sake of uh, uh, sustainability in the global south, this interesting subject could be uh, treated in, in the next uh, ISEF. 
Artificial intelligence, that's a great success. Yeah, congratulations for David for the, this roadmap. I think uh, AI and sustainability or climate change mitigation is a very important subject in terms of reducing carbon dioxide emission, but at the same time, the risk of increasing the use of electricity. So how can we accommodate this AI into the whole uh, system of climate mitigation? I think there are lots of challenges and the risks. So I think this uh, subject may continue to be our uh, future discussion. And I tried the, 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 the issue of uh, geoengineering or uh, planetary boundary. I think it is a very complicated issue. So we may have to consider about that, but I don't know if this could be a good subject or not. But certainly, we should not keep something taboo. So geoengineering was not very well discussed, but in the sense of urgency, maybe we still may need to talk about the geoengineering in the near future. Another one which I think uh, there are some, some, somebody who talked about this governance mechanism. I raised the issue with European ambassador. Some kind of uh, uh, global climate and energy governance mechanism should be addressed here. IEA was created 50 years ago at the first oil shock. Under the current climate crisis, maybe kind of world energy and environment organization should be considered. This is, by the way, idea of Climate Governance Commission, co-chaired by Mary Robinson, Johan Rockstrom, and uh, Maria Espinosa. Um, another issue is the leaders, political leaders. Well, we cannot. We cannot make a, much of the impact to this or not, but nationalism or populism cannot solve the global problems like climate change. So late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who is the founding father of ISAF, was a unique Japanese politician with global identity. We miss him a lot. And maybe another issue which we may think about is the science and trust. Uh, Sir Paul Nurse gave us a very interesting speech and insight about the science and trust. He said, we will fail, but we must be resilient to recover from the disaster. And he reminds me of the impact of the Fukushima nuclear accident and its lesson for scientists. Trust in science by people must be maintained with huge effort of scientists themselves. At the crisis, scientists must show clear objectives, firm accountability, and should work together. Nuclear power must be a part of the solution for the sustainable future. Um, but for this purpose, ISAF last year raised the issue of sustainability conditions for the nuclear and SML, small modular reactor, which I think Stephen Chu tapped uh, touched upon is part of the answer, and we have to work on this issue continuously. And nuclear fusion this year, under the Sally Benson's uh, the chair, could be a very interesting future. It's much more, I'm getting much more optimistic than before. Last but not least, gender and diversity. Climate change is not gender neutral, neither generation neutral. So women and younger generation suffer more by the climate change. But they can change the situation by becoming president or prime minister or CEOs. So we urge young people to go as a candidate for the future politician. We strongly commit to invite women and youth to the ISAF. Gender is important to address nuclear safety and security also. I believe that if the president of Tokyo Electric Company were a woman before 2011, she could have avoided that tragic accident. I wear today he for she time. <laughs> this is a UN women's production. Man should not dodge his responsibility to enhance gender balance. Men cannot dodge the consequence of dodging his responsibility. Finally, I want to express my special appreciation 
to Professor Vajraf Shmil for his great contribution today in a special session. His candid and open discussion certainly encourages us to think more about the future and how serious the situation is. We know that Václav is the best person to stimulate us into that, this kind of candid discussion. It's a great success of today. I always thank our fellow steering committee members of their very candid uh, views and discussion and open the attitude for the contribution for the ISAF. I really want to continue with this group and this network to stimulate the uh, future climate change discussion as much as possible. But at the same time, as Minister Nishimura said yesterday, we have to always put three most important things for ISAF. We must innovate, innovate, and innovate. Every day, every year. Thank you very much for your cooperation and let's keep on innovating. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka. Now to conclude the program, we would like to ask Mr. Saito Tamotsu, Chairman of New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization to summarize the ISEF 2023. Mr. Saito, if you please. Good evening, everyone. I am Saito Tamotsu, the chairman of NEDO. On behalf of the organizers of ISAF, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to all of all the participants for joining the 10th anniversary annual meeting. I also would like to thank Mr. Tanaka and all steering committee members for your strong leadership in making this meeting a success. This is the 10th anniversary meeting of ISAF, and we've had a candid discussion with experts from around the world. Looking back at our history, in October 2014, the first ISAF annual meeting was held, and the following year, the Paris Agreement was adapted, which marked a historic turning point in the fight against the climate change. Since then, many countries, regions, and companies have gradually enhanced their climate action for net zero emissions, which ISAF advocated for early one. However, our climate action is not yet enough. Many climate extremes have already happened around the world, and we see recording, record-breaking events almost every year. From the beginning of the year, we had an unprecedented level of wildfire in Canada and Hawaii. And this July was the hottest month since 1880. Even here in Japan, this summer average temperature is the highest on record since 1898. As the UN Secretary General describes this situation as an era of growing global boiling, we are in a climate crisis. At a such critical time, as the organizer of ISAF and the chairman of NEDO, I wanted to emphasize two key points of all of you. The importance of sense of agency and the acceleration of implementation. The IPCC just completed in last, last report in June by saying adverse impact from human caused climate change will continue to intensify and the extent to which current and future generations will experience a hotter, different world depends on choice now and near term. 
In other words, our actions today is shaped in future of our planet and lives of future generations. That's why we must take bold action with a sense of urgency. At this ISAF meeting, we see many younger generations voice, voicing their commitment to climate change. And it is important that device actors take bold action with a sense of agency. Another message is the importance of accelerating implementation. What we need now is to go beyond talking about goal and target and to implement various politics and projects into concrete action. As you may have realized, ISAF is a place where high-level discussion makes come together to acceler accelerate concrete implementation, not a press chat for discussion. NETO is one of the biggest funding agencies in Japan, acting as an innovation accelerator to promote technology development and implement results into society in a timely manner. As the chairman of NEDO, I promise all of you, NEDO is going to further accelerate the implementation of various green energy projects with a sense of agency and leverage the $20 billion green innovation fund that NEDO handles. It's the first of kind in Japan. In closing, I'd like to thank you again, thank you again, and the participants for joining the 10th anniversary meeting. I look forward to working all of you in advanced goal climate action and to sharing the positive progress of our action at the next ISF meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>